You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. So welcome to everyone who's joined this um, collaborative event today between INCJ, the International Criminal Justice Network, and Insights 22, which um, is hosted by um, Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service. This is an event um, that will explore from a number of different angles, mothers and the criminal justice system. And I'm delighted that we've got um, a range of participants today, um, all of whom I'm sure will um, set the scene in terms of their contribution to this important agenda. So we have Dr. Lucy Baldwin, Baldwin uh, Professor Mary Rogan from uh, Trinity College Dublin. We have um, Bev Stevens, who's a policy lead for Sodexo, who operates a number of the women's prisons um, in England. We have Jean Lu. Luberg um, from Finland, um, who's going to be offering her perspective on policy from Finland in terms of working with women. Anastasia Lupint, um, again from Finland, who's a team leader engaged with family work. And Dr. Chelsea Harvey from Sam Houston State University, Texas. So a wide base of contributors. Um, we will be starting the event with a number of formal presentations and it's my job really to keep us to task in terms of ensuring that each speaker is able to share with you their important research. And then we'll be moving on to have a round table discussion amongst the presenters on the call today. But I'd also really like to encourage you to post your questions and observations in the chat. And I will do my best as the, um, as the chair to pick those uh, questions up as we go through. Now it's Lucy Baldwin who's going to start us this afternoon um, talking about her research with criminalized mothers and her ongoing work with prisons and probation in the, in the in UK. Lucy's research focuses on the importance of recognizing maternal trauma, maternal identity, and maternal emotion for, ma maternal emotion for mothers either in prison or under supervision. I've certainly had the benefit of listening to um, Lucy talk previously on this important subject, and um, I'm sure she will quite rightly um, set the scene this afternoon. And then, as I say, we'll move us through the other presentations. So thank you, everyone, for your attendance today. I'm sure this is going to be um, a very interesting um, time for us to reflect and really think about the impact of both imprisonment and being subject to supervision as a woman and as a mother. So on that note, as the chair, I'm going to hand over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me um, in, C in C D, C D. <laughs> And it's lovely to see everybody here. Um, I am, I'm not going to use the presentation this morning because I've been advised you trying to avoid them in this setting. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, my research and anybody who already knows me knows I don't find that hard. <laughs> um, so I've done um, various different pieces of research in the UK with with focusing on mothers. And I think, I suppose the biggest thing that, that comes out of my research, I think, is, is that we don't historically or we haven't historically factored in the layer of motherhood in really, enough in our work with um, women, criminalised women. And I think that, that's, there's lots of reasons for that. And I think um, when we when a woman is criminalised, particularly when a mother is criminalised, I think she's she's deemed to be much more um, deviant, I think, than fathers who, who are criminalised. And part of that is because of all of the expectations around motherhood and the judgment around motherhood. But I think there's also an othering that goes on around criminalised women and criminalised mothers, almost as if mothers in the criminal justice system are offenders first or prisoners first and mothers second, third, fourth or even discounted. And, and I think 
one of the things that came out in my research was that in, in not factoring in this layer of motherhood, either in terms of maternal emotion, maternal identity or maternal trauma particularly, we're missing a trick. We're missing a trick not only in terms of our interventions with mothers in the criminal justice system, but also how women experience the criminal justice system. And when, I mean, one of the things in, if I kind of separate into pre-prison, prison and post-prison, pre-prison, I think one of the things that my research highlighted really heavily was that there's a huge relevance to women's own experience of being mothered. And where that's been a negative or poor experience has an impact that is imported into the criminal justice system and into prison and into obviously their own mothering relationships with their children. Um, and I'm going to show a, a cycle in, in one second. I'm going to use one slide. I can't bear to not use any. Um, and so we're missing and losing opportunities to harness and respond to motherhood more positively than we currently do, even before women are criminalised. And I think that's really important. And the police come into that, how women are arrested, how women's houses are raided, how women are remanded. That all comes into it. So it's the police and the court, I think, have they also need to factor in motherhood in a different way than perhaps we do now. Then in prison, my research really revealed that grandmothers, particularly in prison, are a, are a really invisible population and that their maternal shame is layered. You know, you have grandmothers who, who are traumatised at not only being separated from children, but from grandchildren. They've been taken out to have a caregiving role and their needs are not always accounted for within the prison because they don't qualify some of the... Um, some of the benefits that mothers get in terms of childcare leave or in terms of family days or in terms of how visits are set up. So mothers are, grandmothers can be really neglected in that. And that, and I think we don't allow enough opportunities in prison for women to mother each other. And I know we've spoken, Bev and I, Bev will talk about this a, bit, a little bit later on in terms of our motherhood mentors, but certainly we've really witnessed how women mothering each other in spaces in prison is really important. And that brought up some of the issues about whether prisons were open and closed, the, the environment or the prison space, how much free movement women can have. So there was lots of things around those maternal relationships and being able to share a motherhood identity identity with other, with other mothers. And I found that the mothers really benefited from having conversations about motherhood, but that often they would shy away from those conversations, particularly in closed conditions or more restrictive conditions, because they didn't want to start a conversation and not know where that was going to go and not know the mother's circumstances and not want to trigger something that was going to be painful and challenging and lead to self-harm or worse. So the prison space and how prison space is organised and, and the rules around prison as, as a real relationship with how well a mother copes with prison or not. And I found that there was some real institutional thoughtlessness, that not malicious and not, not necessarily deliberate, but a thoughtlessness around motherhood in prison. So, for example, um, moving a, a woman to another prison with very little notice without checking there was a visit book, that kind of thing, not allowing a reception phone call to three different houses if children are in three different homes, but saying, yes, you've got your reception phone call, but that's one phone call, but what if your children are in three different houses, which often happens. So there was elements of thoughtlessness that were institutionally based that certainly Bev and I at HMB Peterborough have, have been working on and made some significant changes that Bev's going to talk about a little bit later on. So there was lots around those kind of aspects and about managing emotions and conversations from visits. Um, like if, if there'd been a difficult visit, I think often in prison, sometimes there's a misunderstanding of women's emotions and so and a lack of acknowledgement for how that is, how, how that might play out. So, for example, if a mum gets a phone call about that's really distressing from a child who's really distressed, but then you expect that mum to go straight into a sentence planning meeting. And similarly on probation on the outside, how easy is that to do if your heart and your mind is really occupied with, with being a mother? And there's often that assumption that women in prison, particularly if they've been in a chaotic life beforehand or they've used substances, that they're not concerned with their children. Whereas my research 
really reiterated to me that women are, it might not necessarily be obvious to everyone around them, but their primary concern is often their children or their guilt or their grief at not being able to be the mother they've wanted to be. And I definitely found in my research that guilt is a life-threatening emotion for criminalised mothers. And so there was lots of things in prison that were really challenging specifically to mothers. And sometimes that trauma around being separated from children, it wasn't being recognised and it was actually being triggered by conversations like say for example a mum might come into prison and an officer would say I mean you know you've got four children and the woman will hear you've got four children you should be ashamed you shouldn't be in prison that's awful where a better way to have that conversation would be so you've got four children what are the names what are the ages what can I do to support you so it's the same thing but a very different emphasis so that kind of led into me wanting to develop things around um staff training um so there was lots of things in prison but also moving outside for a lot of my women I interviewed 46 women um in and after prison and and used letters and they all had quite different experiences of probation as well some of those things around probation kind of mirrored what their experiences in prison in that they might come out homeless without their children their children might have been removed into care then a probation officer wants to talk about their offending and for the mum they want to focus on getting their children back or they want to focus on having a house to get their children back and without having that free headspace and heart space it's very difficult to focus and motivate yourself and so I found that the women in my research would say they're not interested in me as a person they're not interested in me as a mother what is the point in me engaging and some women would withdraw from probation supervision because it it, it didn't feel relevant to them in that space. Alternatively, there were some women who had extremely good prison officers or good probation officers, and in those instances, motherhood was harnessed, respected, responded to, and women engaged and were successfully, you know, enabled and facilitated to carry on with the assistance journey. So for all of the women at every stage, motherhood was absolutely relevant. And Sonia, have I got time to show one slide? Lucy, yes, I was going to suggest you can go up to um, 55 um, because we took five minutes of your time. So please don't hurry. You've got I'm, I'm going to you've got till um, 15.55. Right. Smashing. I just want to show this one particular slide because I think um, it's quite. Um, it's quite an easy cycle for me to explain. And forgive me, Fiona and anybody else who was there on. Friday because you will have seen this or perhaps you might have seen this can you see this slide this is this is something that I call a circle of circumstance and this is you know a lot of the women who enter the criminal justice system are living in circumstances of poverty or trauma or abuse and um, so that a circle of circumstances already around mothers and then we have women who who have either a specific trauma, a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events through childhood. That might be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, or all of those things continuing, but there's an original trauma. And then if that woman is a mother, we know that, I don't know, in, in the UK, I mean, Anastasia and Sari and Chelsea, you perhaps will be able to tell us what it's like in your countries. In the UK, we have a real shortage of mental health services and resources to support women. Um, that are gendered and trauma informed. You know, there are some fantastic services, but there's a distinct shortage. So sometimes there's missed and lost opportunities to support women through trauma and particularly mothers. Um, and so sometimes people who are traumatized will, will use substances to cope, to block out the original trauma and to cope. And if that woman is a mother, a mother using substances is really quite afraid of accessing support because for that woman the stakes are very high the the ultimate pain would be losing her children so women who are mothers very often don't ask for help even if they know they need help because it's very hard to, to lose that fear of engaging and having an unwanted intervention which can then mean an intervention occurs at the crisis point now the crisis point can be an arrest 
or it can be something specifically to do with the children. But at that point, if child protection services become involved and a child is removed, very often the way it works over here is if if a child is removed, then social services input tends to be removed along with that child. So now you have a mum who has the original trauma, uh, um, a, a, a way of coping with trauma in substances, and now she has no child. So then you and then you remove that support. So now you've got the original trauma and the maternal trauma. And unless we respond to that maternal trauma, this cycle persists. And I'm sure we've all met women in the criminal justice system who've lost more than one child. And a question I hear officers say all the time is, why does she just keep having children? Well, this is why. <laughs> this is why. Because she's she's managing that maternal trauma in the only way that she can. And when a mother loses a child, very often the desire to fill that gap, if you like, fill that emotional hurt and hole is with another child. It happens in the criminal justice system very often with women who are already traumatised, who are already addicted to a substance and who are, who already use that as a, a method of coping. And if we don't respond to that maternal trauma, then we can't we can't interrupt this cycle. And, and you have women who stay in this cycle of pain and they either have more and more children or they just keep going round in this cycle of pain with the maternal guilt and trauma and loss kind of embedded in that trauma and I think one of the things that has led from my research thankfully is that the probation service over here and the criminal justice the prison service have been really responsive to some of the information that I've been able to share with them in terms of research so I've shared um, an aid memoir for the probation service which means for the first time there's something on the probation service internet for supervisors to look at um, to help them in their supervision of mothers, I've provided tools for the newly launched or new it launched this week. I think the newly launched toolkit for women, um, and so there are some useful tools in there. And we're looking right now at developing more specific probation officer training. It was regional, but after a conversation on Friday, potentially it might be national. And similarly with the prison service. So through our motherhood project, it's the death so which I'm going to talk about. This research has kind of really translated into practice and is making a difference in, in prison and hopefully in probation little by little. So that seems a perfect time for me to end, I think. Lucy, thank you. That was uh, really fascinating. And you're quite correct. You have provided um, the probation service in England and Wales with some really useful tools. But it'd be great also to hear this afternoon from our um, colleagues from um, Finland and America in terms of um, maybe their approach on that subject. Okay, I'm going to hand on to our next speaker now. It's Professor Mary Logan, um, who's going to um, talk on this subject, but from the perspective of human rights. So, um, Mary, would you like to come in? Thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you to Lucy, Rob and John and others for bringing us together and Lucy thanks very much for all your work on this topic and for sharing your your research um, so well just now. Um, I'm going to speak today about the human rights perspective on the question of motherhood in prison and I feel like I very much must start by saying that fundamentally motherhood imprisonment and compliance with human rights makes for a very difficult circle to square because no matter which way one looks at it or however well-intentioned we are, protection of the human rights of mothers and children is drastically undermined by the fact of imprisonment. That being said, there have been efforts to try to mitigate this situation within international and domestic human rights law documents. And some of these examine things that can be done within prison, but many emphasize the need to limit the use of imprisonment in these situations. And I think the international human rights standards the sort of thrusts of them or what they tend to explore in this area falls into three main categories, healthcare in pregnancy and after birth, access to children, and then the need for alternatives to custody. Um, and importantly, there is a specific instrument that many of you will know on women um, in the United Nations Human Rights Standards uh, Lexicon, the Bangkok rules, the United Nations rules for the treatment of women, prisoners and non-custodial measures adopted in 2011. And I think it is an important statement that there is a specific instrument 
uh, concerning women uh, within the human rights uh, framework and standards that we have. These rules, the Bangkok rules, cover a wide range of issues, um, including arrangements upon admission, hygiene, rehabilitation, post-release programmes and non-custodial measures. And if we look at the aspects of it which deal most specifically with the question of motherhood, we see in the preamble the need being emphasised for non-custodial approaches for women. And the rules state, uh, taking into consideration the gender specificities of and the consequent need to give priority to applying non-custodial measures to women who have come into contact with the criminal justice system. This is kind of a foundational principle upon which the rules are built. Um, as I mentioned, they cover a whole variety of issues. Just to give you a, a flavour, rule four of the Bangkok rules requires women to be allocated to the extent possible to prisons close to either their home or their place of social rehabilitation taking account of their caregiving responsibilities. Rule five requires a very basic thing of a regular supply of water to be made available to all women, especially those who are pregnant, breastfeeding or menstruating. Rule 28 requires visits at, between a mother and her children to allow for open contact and to in, make sure that visits involving extended contact with children are encouraged wherever possible. Rule three states that all staff assigned to work with women prisoners shall receive training specifically related to the gender specific needs and human rights of women. So looking at these provisions in a bit more detail, rule 2.2 of the rules requires that prior to or on admission, women who have caretaking responsibilities for children shall be permitted to make arrangements for those children. And I'm struck by what Lucy said about caregiving responsibilities, you know, not necessarily being confined to, to, to mothers. Um, and that these arrangements should include under the rules the possibility for a reasonable suspension of detention, taking into account the best interests of the children. Rule 6B is a very important one, I think, because it places an obligation on states when they're doing health screening of women on entry to determine the reproductive health history of the woman prisoner including current or recent pregnancies, childbirth, and any related reproductive health issues. And there is a right also in Rule 8, importantly, to refuse screening uh, on, on the part of the woman regarding their reproductive health history. But I think any of us who've encountered um, women's health or who, who, who know about women's health often feel that these aspects of health can be overlooked. And I think it is a very important statement that those issues are to be included in a, a health screening of women on admission. Under Rule 9, if a woman is to be accompanied by a child, that child is also to undergo health screening, preferably by a child health specialist. And the rules require that suitable health care, at least equivalent to that available in the community, is to be provided. Now, as, as you'll see, a common theme running throughout all of these standards is, in some respects, they're minimum, but in some respects, unfortunately, they're, they're, uh, they're aspirational, as we know that many um institutions and settings do not even fulfill these minimum standards. Um, I mentioned that healthcare is a recurrent theme in many of the international human rights standards. Uh, under Rule 19 of the Bangkok Rules, gender-specific healthcare services of equivalent to the community shall be provided to women prisoners. And the rules also contain a statement on the presence of staff when a person is undergoing medical examinations. And this can be a massive issue uh, for women in hospital, especially during pregnancy. Uh, rule 11 requires that only medical staff shall be present during medical examinations unless the doctor is of the view that exceptional circumstances exist or the doctor requests a member of the prison staff to be present for security reasons or the woman wants the presence of a member of staff. If it is necessary for non-medical prison staff to be present during medical examinations, these staff should be women and the examinations shall be carried out in a manner that safeguards privacy, dignity and confidentiality. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said here, a lot to sort of take out of these rules about training for medical staff um, and nursing staff as well about their level of comfort and their ability to manage consultations uh, with women coming into them from prison and, you know, avoiding the need for staff presence unless it's really absolutely necessary. 
The rules also co cover the issue of discipline and punishment. Uh, segregation or close confinement must not be applied to pregnant women, women with infants and breastfeeding mothers in prison under Rule 22. And Rule 23 requires that if a woman is to be subject to disciplinary sanctions, that should not include a prohibition of family contact, especially with children. And Rule 24 also requires that instruments of restraint must never be used on women during labour, birth and immediately after birth. And again, unfortunately, we know that is not respected everywhere. Uh, contact with the outside world is an important theme in the rules. Uh, rule 26 requires the encouragement and facilitation of contact with families and children. And where possible measures, a kind of a vague statement should be taken to counterbalance disadvantages faced by women detained in institutions which are far from their homes. And when children do come to visit under Rule 28, the rules require that the environment is to be conducive to a positive, positive visiting experience. Importantly, it's stating that this also includes staff attitudes, not just the physical material conditions of the visit and open contact should be encouraged. There is a special section on pregnant breastfeeding um, women and mothers. They are to receive advice on their health and diet, a health practitioners to oversee that. They must get adequate and timely food, a healthy environment and regular exercise opportunities free of charge. They are to be encouraged, or I should say, they are not to be discouraged from breastfeeding their children. And their, the medical and nutritional needs of women who have recently given birth but whose children are not present in the prison are also to be included in treatment programmes. The next main theme is concerns, concerns this very challenging question of when a mother can stay with the ch child in the prison context. And Rule 49, in keeping with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, requires these decisions to be based on the best interests of the children. Um, and Rule 50 requires women whose children are with them to have the maximum possible opportunity to spend time with their children. And Rule 51 wants uh, authorities to make sure that the environment is as close as possible to that of a child outside prison, as, as difficult as that, impossible as that is. Uh, Rule 52 talks about the decision making around removing a child. Um, and again, it's to be based on individual assessment and best interests. Um, importantly, and perhaps it doesn't get, you know, an enormous amount of, of word count in the rules, but it is an important principle that non-custodial sentences for pregnant women and women with dependent children are to be preferred where possible um, and to take into account the best interests of the child. The Mandela rules are from 2015 and they're general, they're not specific to women, but they do contain some provisions on prenatal and postnatal care, requiring um, arrangements to be made wherever practic practicable for children to be born in hospital outside prison. Um, again, any decisions about keeping the child with the parent in prison are to be based on the child's best interests. Importantly, they require states to, to facilitate internal or external childcare facilities staffed by qualified people where children can go where they're not being cared for by their parent and admissions. Uh, the European prison rules, and I'll finish up very shortly, does not have a specific, sorry, does not have a very strong statement on motherhood specifically. It does require gender sensitive policies and it does require provision for a nursery to be uh, placed in a prison um, where the a parent is otherwise um, engaged in activities. Um, it doesn't speak specifically about the screening for reproductive history. And just following on from that, the European Court of Human Rights has found that the prohibition on inhuman and degrading treatment has been breached where a woman was subject to the requirement to wear a handcuff during a gynecological examination. And it's a rare, actually rare example of the European Court of Human Rights being tasked with an assessment of this kind in the case of women's health. And just to finish up on the work of the CPT, so as part of our research in Trinity, we did an, uh, an analysis of 31 CPT reports published between January 2016 uh, and December 2019. And of those 45, of those, there were 31 reports, there were 45 reports in total, but 31 included reports of a visit 
to a prison containing women. And it's quite interesting, uh, the highest sort of level of CPT statement within a report uh, concerns recommendations. And we found that only 0.9% of the CPT's recommendations in the area of gender sensitive ones concerned antenatal, postnatal and childcare, but they had several statements about the need for a non-custodial approach. Um, And just to finish up by saying, I think one issue that will merit a lot more consideration in international human rights standards over time is the question of getting pregnant if a person wants to do that and fertility and the uh, facilitation of fertility, uh, if that is something that the woman wishes to pursue, I think that's an area which is going to need a lot more consideration in future. Um, But for now, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Mary, thank you. That was a really um, helpful review of the um, requirements in terms of gender specific rights for women around healthcare and some other really important topics as well. Um, I'm going to move us on now to our next speaker, um, Bev Stevens, who's the policy lead for Sodexo. She's been engaged in developing grassroots approach to um, developing uh, frontline staff in terms of their care for women in establishments. So, Bev, would you like to come in? Thank you, Sonia. Um, so, so just to talk about really how the journey started with Lucy. So back in 2020, um, I read Lucy's book, Mother Injustice, whilst I was on maternity leave myself with my first child um, and contacted Lucy about the possibility of working together when I returned. Um, I'd been working in female prisons since 2005, so quite a considerable time, but it wasn't until I became a mum myself just before lockdown um, that I really considered the impact of mothers beyond the perinatal period. Um, and Lucy touched on this earlier, that there, there is a huge amount of support for women within that period, but this was about mothers more generally. Um, and I've had endless conversations with women um, one as recently as last week where they're, they're not expecting to come to custody um, or they're not prepared to come to custody and, and are often advised that they couldn't possibly come to custody because they're a mother. So they really haven't made preparations and, and considered the possibility of coming to custody. Um, and, and as women's policy lead for Sodexo, I've always known that around a third of women who come into our care have never been in prison previously. Um, and half half of the women that come in tell us that they're a mother, but that's that's only the half that tell us. So um, we know that there'd be women that come into our care that don't share that information because they're so scared of coming into custody generally. They don't want to share that information for fear of what would happen next. So Lucy and I began working together formally um, and that's been happening since June 2021 Um, and prior to that, um, prior to June 2021, we spent a lot of time with mothers and grandmothers in custody about what they want from this project. Um, We didn't want to do it to them, we wanted them to be part of it. Um, and we asked them what would make a difference to them or, or what would have made a difference to them in court, in police, prior to coming into prison. And, and from that, we've identified um, some gaps, challenges and opportunities. Um, what was really clear from the outset of speaking to women um, is that they carried a lot of guilt and shame. Um, and what re- was a real eye opener for me was they thought they were alone. They thought, you know, they were the only mum in prison that carried this guilt of being in prison and not with their children. Um, so that was that was a fundamental base to everything that we did, that um, we wanted to assure women that they weren't alone. So some of the priorities we identified that we've, we've now implemented. So first and foremost was around facilitating a voice for mothers and grandmothers. Um, And we spoke to women from Peterborough and Bromsfield to hear what they wanted. Um, And it was really clear that actually just a space to come together to be a mum was really important to them. Um, So we introduced a mother's club, which is just a safe space for mum to come together. Um, And we've seen some really wonderful examples of mums just sharing some tips and, you know, hints and tips about 
how to maintain contact with their children whilst in prison. Um, so we often provide that space without a formal agenda, but we're also trying to bring some themes to those to those clubs. So our theme for this Friday is around promoting the legal support that's available for them whilst whilst in prison. So Lucy and I have started to work with a charity which provides free family legal advice within the prison and also through the gate. Um, something that came, came across from the mums that we spoke to and the grandmothers as well is that they really wanted a peer support role that they could have easy access to um, whilst in prison. So we've created a role of motherhood mentors. So we've got two women that are currently carrying out that role, um, both mothers themselves with uh, different experiences. Um, and what was really interesting is they were already doing this role to some degree. So one of our motherhood mentors um, prior to formally doing this role was already helping women read letters, write letters to their children if they struggled with literacy. Um, she gave an example where she'd knitted a blanket for a young woman who was pregnant on her wing. Um, so, so mothering mothers within prison. So we wanted to formalise that role and make it easily accessible to all women. Um, so these motherhood mentors have free access to all women across the whole prison for that support when they need it. Um, we co-created uh, with the women and myself and Lucy a booklet that's very specific to the needs of mothers and grandmothers when they come into prison. So there's practical support, such as visits, entitlements, um, but also hints and tips for maintaining contact. Um, you know, as I said before, so many of the women that come into our care are brand new to custody. Um, so whilst we share information about things such as visits as part of our induction process, sometimes that always doesn't always, uh, they don't always remember that. So we wanted to give them a guide they can refer back to for that support and information as and when they needed it. Um, something the women fed back to us and, and also the staff fed back to us, and, and this relates to Lucy's research, is that staff didn't have the confidence to ask difficult questions when it comes to being a mother or for children, um, to show that compassion. Um, and we really encourage at Sodexo that we look behind the behaviour so we wanted staff to have the confidence and, and, and the knowledge to understand why somebody's behaving in a certain way. And, you know, it's certainly something I was able to reflect on being a new mum of, you know, how would I feel if I'd just spoken to my child who was upset or unwell on the phone and I couldn't do anything about it? Um, so the training that we offer staff really focuses on that and, and not to be worried about asking questions or, you know, sharing a knowledge or interest in, in what's going on. Um, and something that's been introduced recently, so we've just delivered our first course, um, our Mother in Justice course. So Lucy delivered that um, to nine women um, in the prison alongside our Family Matters team. Hugely successful. Um, all women maintained engagement throughout all six days. Um, and something that was quite astounding, really, for me was that one particular woman said she'd never been able to speak about her children while she's been in prison. Um, so it was a real, like, similar to the mothers' clubs, it was a real safe opportunity for mums to be mums. Um, and one woman talks about how staff and um, prisoners have fed back that she physically looks different. And I have to say, I can see the physical change in these women um, from attending that course. Now, something that was important um, for Lucy and I was that the motherhood mentors attended that course as mothers initially but it also enabled them to provide that continued support throughout the program and beyond um, so that that support continues beyond the course via our motherhood mentors. Um, some of the other things that weren't in our original plan but are proving quite successful like we've um, Lucy and I have set up some small groups with probation colleagues and together we're reviewing practices in the community as well as prison to ensure 
any support and positive changes we make are reflective throughout the whole journey. Um, and something we're really proud of is um, through consultation with the women that we've spoken to, um, one of our one of the mothers in our mother and baby unit spoke about um, prior to coming to prison for the first time, um, she was seriously considering the termination for her child because she wasn't aware of the support and the facilities such as mother and baby units in prison. Um, so, so the the mother who who discussed this with us, she's now left the prison, but actually she's developing a poster for um, police stations to um, raise awareness of what is available um, you, you know in the hope that women can come to prison prepared um, and understand what is available um, so they're really the main things that we've introduced in Peterborough um, and Bronzefield um, but we're, we're super proud to be working with Lucy and able to put her research into practice um, and make some real fundamental changes to, to mothers that are in our care. Bev, that's fantastic. And that really comes out. I really liked that concept of mothering mentors and giving women, you know, the encouragement because of the shame they carry to actually talk about being mothers in, in prison. Um, I think that's really, really love, great initiative. Um, on the subject of what are the things that we can be positive about for the future in the way that we address the issues that have been spelled out here, I just wondered um, if I could invite um, Sari and then Anastasia to give a perspective from Finland in terms of the projects that you've been directly involved in, in terms of the positives that you would pull out from that in respect of your services. So sorry, there's the the C, um, the Women Project. I don't know if you want to talk to that for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, gladly. Thank you. Um, in our project, we have worked with women from 2018, I think, and and uh, we give counselling in prisons to women and after the rele rele release. And and I think um, the most positive observation we have made is that I think um, a good example is that uh, in Finland we have changed prison prisons for women's prisons uh, like that that there have been like mixed prisons before and then they remove the men <laughs> outside from the prison and tada we have a women's prison well I think the practice is the most important thing a women's prison needs not that there are any aren't any men in there but we need the practice and i think the positive thing is that we are, we are currently um, i can see that there is uh, an e uh, awakening interest to female specific work in here and and yeah. that's a really good sign that people are interested to hear the needs women and mothers have and all the practice we can use to support, support them and give the counseling they need and the help they need. So I think that that is the most important thing. In Finland, we have approximately 250 to 3,000, uh, 3,000. 300, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> three, uh, two to th 300 uh, women prisoners annually. And um, the population, they are really marginalized. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and so, so they face so many um, attitudes in our society and we need a, uh, to change that. And we try to... Uh, to like make people see that we have these specific needs and these women who need our support and we have to continue to talk about them and talk about especially the mothers because two-thirds of women thank you 
Sorry, that's great. And you're, you're absolutely right. I think once you, you establish that mindset that women are different, it sounds so obvious, but to actually deliver services which are specific to their needs and not um, adapting um, often prison systems that were introduced to deal with men and then just fitting women into that. So that's a really important observation. Anastasia, I know you're involved in um, some really interesting family work. Um, would you like to talk about that and the positives you've drawn from it? Uh, I can do that, but I was wondering whether Sari could, for just a couple of sentences, talk about the trauma-informed work you did with one open prison unit because that's really interesting and positive. I can't remember what you are, you, you are you applying to. You <laughs> these groups where you discussed with the prisoners about what trauma-informed means. And trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have organized some groups during the COVID uh, by video calls, and, and we have talked about different emotions with women and with mothers, uh, considering like guilt and shame and traumas also. And we are doing that with the prisoners and the mothers and also with the guards and officers. So we, we give them information about how, what is trauma and how they affect on people and, and how we can um, like, mm, how we can face them in a correct way and, and give, give appreciation to women. And, and like, the, like we, we have to understand about the backgrounds if we want to help them. And, and I think it's also important that the women themselves get the information about why, why am I feeling like this and why am I acting like this way? That is isn't isn't rational or something like that. That so yeah, that we are doing right now. Excellent. Okay. Um, Anastasia, uh, yeah. did you want to come back in? Yeah. Sorry, I did not mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Whereas uh, I'll I can. Uh, give a very short introduction of what what I do. Um, I work with with families and and near ones, or loved ones of prisoners, with two of my colleagues. Um, and I have to say that we do not work specifically with women, and women are uh, at the moment a minority uh, as as criminalized women. So we do uh, face more uh, of the of the men male prisoners. But we offer one-to-one um, -one support to, to family members, um, a place of understanding and no judgment. We can also work one-to-one -one with children, but uh, not, not so often. Uh, we focus a lot on parenting and parenthood issues, and this is where we cross-cut with, with what Sari and her colleagues are doing. Um, what I could mention specifically is that we have these family camps. I don't know what would be an appropriate translation for it, but in Finnish, we call them camps uh, four times a year with four to six families, uh, prisoners and uh, with their families. So uh, three of these would be for, for par parents with children, but they can also um, include a parent with children in care. So. Uh, uh, as I said, that we largely uh, work with, with male prisoners. And I think this also shows a large picture of, of the disadvantage of women in prisons, that, uh, that imprisoned women are so rare in our camps and, and mostly would have uh, children uh, coming to camp from care or, or they would have a partner in prison as well. Whereas the men are more likely to have a a partner waiting at home, taking care of, of their joint children or uh, of, of the prisoner's children. So uh, it's, it's sad that we, we don't have so many female prisoners coming, but I think it's a part of, of what's happening um, in, in other, other ways. Um, we've had a small assignment with Sari uh, related to the participation or, or involvement of parents uh, with a child in uh, child protection services or in care 
and this has uh, this. I want to mention this because this is the reason why we are here today. Because that led that thought led me to Lucy, and we've had discussions with Lucy, and now now we we are here. Uh, can I take one moment still? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to um, just to bring because so there are so many things that uh, that sounded familiar with with, for example, what Lucy was talking, and I feel so inspired about what you're doing with Sodexo, uh, but, but this about othering of, of, of women that you're a mother, third or fourth or last, uh, it sounds so familiar. And, and we, um, uh, women in prison here are seen as, as kind of very difficult. And I was wondering whether it has to do with the, the confidence that Bev mentioned, that, that the staff does not have the confidence to ask about yeah. the difficult questions because they'll see the women as so so difficult. Um, but as as uh, we talked earlier, that that being seen as a mother can be a healing experience. It can become a physical change. So I think it's it, it would be really important to uh, to bring that perspective to to for a person to have that role to be something else than a prisoner. It can be really powerful for. The person in prison, but also for to uh, something that supports the prisoner's goals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, when we th think about mothers, well, I think we should also um, kind of widen the understanding of who is a mother, because a mother can be someone who has never given birth. You you might have miscarried, or your uh, your social mother, um, someone who's lost her child, child um, has been taken into care, or that your child has died someone who has lost contact with their children or someone uh, who wants to be a mother uh, in the future or, or to get back the children, as well as those, those who are primary carers throughout. So um, taking all these perspectives into account uh, makes a difference for much more than those who have a child waiting at home. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, there's some really useful observations there that I'm sure we can build on in the discussion. But I just wanted to um, invite uh, Chelsea in now from her, from her kind of academic perspective, both to touch on the research that she has undertaken in this area, but also to answer the question, you know, what more research should we be thinking about now? So, Chelsea, did you want to come in? Yes, absolutely. Um... Just to give you a little bit of an overview also, there are obviously very drastic differences between the populations of people that are incarcerated in the US and those that are incarcerated in other countries, right? Uh, within the United States, we house 25% of the world's prison population, right? So a quarter of everyone who is incarcerated is incarcerated within the US. Um, while women only make up about 7% of our state and federal prisons, uh, in the last several decades, their numbers have increased much more rapidly than males. So just to give you some perspective, since 1980, the female prison population increased by 650% versus 300% for males. A lot of that is related to the war on drugs um, because a lot of women are incarcerated for drug-related crimes. Much like Lucy was saying, it seems to be similar there as well, right? Only about 10% of incarcerated women are in prison for violent offenses. And this relates to some of the work that I do specifically as well. Of the 2.2 million people we have incarcerated in the US, um, just under 2 million, so about 1.8 million are parents. So that means that about 10% of all the children in the US actually have a parent that is under correctional supervision. Now, most of these are fathers because there are more males incarcerated, right? Um, which then leaves single mothers alone to do a lot of the work. Uh, but there's also a lot of issues that surround mothers who are incarcerated as well, right? So it, it was disheartening to hear the, the difference of, Sari was saying that they you have about 200 to 300 women who are incarcerated every year. Uh, we have about 200,000 to 300,000 women who are incarcerated every year in the US, right? Um, 
And about 70% of those women, 70, 70, 70 to 75% of those women were caring for minor children prior to being incarcerated. So most of these women are mothers. Um, and Anastasia, to, to your point, right, it's, I, I really appreciate you saying that we have to expand the definition of mother. And if we did, I would not be surprised if it's more like 90% of women were are, are do identify as a mother in some way, right? And identity is something really critical that I actually have a note on for future research to look at, right? So what some of the research does show us and um, some of the work I do is first, the effects that this has on the children specifically, right? So for young children who have incarcerated mothers, we know that they experience significant developmental delays uh, both physically and emotionally. Uh, they have separation anxiety issues and long-term attachment issues as well. And that lingers throughout their life course. Um, for school-age children, what some of the research has shown us is that they suffer from severe behavioral issues, major educational delays, and as well, uh, emotional trouble. A lot of trouble regulating emotions and understanding their emotions. And for those that are older, they're much more likely to drop out and they're also much more likely to end up incarcerated themselves, right? So there are long-term issues as well as short-term issues that children deal with from a trauma perspective as well, right? So moving forward, a lot of the research needs to look at that mm -hmm. um, and continue to evaluate the long-term effects on children. However, with for the mothers specifically, we also really need to further examine what helps them maintain their identity as mothers and be more successful upon release when they are released from prison, right? So some of the work has shown us that if we're able to support them in maintaining close relationships with their kids, um, being able to have visits from their children, and having some level of expectation that they will have custody upon release, this actually does improve their identity as mothers while incarcerated and moving forward. And we know that this identity is very, very critical. As Lucy mentioned, if we don't factor in that motherhood role, we rob them of one of their primary identities. A lot of my work has also looked at one's perspective and perception of success upon release. And we know that if people have a perception that they're likely to succeed upon release, that might actually make them more successful in, in re-entering successfully. And motherhood for these women is a criti criti critical part of that equation, basically, right? So moving forward, a lot of future research also needs to evaluate that and how we can effectively expand the capacity of community-based corrections. Here in the US, one of the major issues that Mary touched on as well are these ethical issues. Um, so we don't necessarily have a shortage of mental health services, but rather we have a lot of, there's a great lack of access due to finances. Um, incarcerated women are an extremely marginalized group of people here. And the way the U.S. medical system works is if they need mental health services, that needs to be either paid for out of pocket or they need to have insurance, right? And a lot of these women don't have that. Most incarcerated mothers here are unemployed. They lack high school diplomas. They face very limited access to social services, to health care, to stable housing prior to incarceration. And most of them also have histories of physical and sexual abuse, victimization, and trauma, right? And so a lot of them are incarcerated for drug-related issues in response to this. So future research needs to really focus on how we can prevent the unnecessary imprisonment of women, right? So we need to look at effective prevention programming through improving social institutions, improving houses, housing, improving healthcare, providing employment opportunities, uh, here specifically ending the war on drugs, but also finding ways that we can keep women who are mothers connected to that identity. Chelsea, thank you. I'd certainly um, echo your observations about how we can build better evidence around um, correctional services and actually preventing um, women from entering custody and what are the most effective means um, to address the range of issues that you presented there. Um, certainly, um, 
the focus on women's centres in England and Wales has been welcomed, but have we got a really strong evidence base in terms of what are the most effective elements to those women's centres that either can be made available as part of a community order or to women when they're released from custody? So I'd definitely share that observation. I'm going to throw that question out now to other members of the panel, or maybe there are people who have been listening who'd like to come in, in terms of where you kind of judge where would be the best um, kind of focus for future research to understand this topic. I'll pick somebody. <laughs> I can't see any questions coming in on the chat. Oh, Fiona. Lovely. Would you like to come in and introduce yourself to the audience? I think you're on mute, Fiona. Oh, that's a shame. You could put your question in the chat if that works and we someone could pick it up. Hello? Okay, um, no worries, Fiona. Put your question in the chat, Fiona. Yeah, put it in the chat. Lucy, would you like to come back on that question about where you think um, important focus should be for future research? Oh my goodness, it's so, there's so much, isn't there? There's so much to do, but I think the important thing, whatever we do going forward research-wise, I think it has to be co-produced research, and I think we have to capture the voices of, of women themselves, um, it, perhaps in better ways than we have historically, and I think um, so exploring ways in which we can undertake participatory and co-produce co research for me, whatever we focus on next, it has to be with the women. Um, and I think one of the things that I would really like to see in terms of research is some more research around the sentences, because certainly in the UK, it's mainly magistrates who sentence women as opposed to Crown Court judges because of the lack of seriousness of women's offending. And we know over here, I don't know what it's like internationally, and I'd be really interested to hear that magistrates um, it, are not formally trained. They have a limited amount of training and they're drawn from a pool that is predominantly white middle class male because it has to be somebody who's financially stable enough to be able to undertake a voluntary role. And there has been some research about the lack of um, failure to undertake or adhere to the Bangkok rules and the sentencing guidelines. But whenever I speak to magistrates, <laughs> despite the fact every time I go to prison, I meet somebody who's in prison for shoplifting or truancy or TV licence, magistrates will always say, oh, I never send anyone to prison. So I think for me, I would like to see a really substantial piece of work around sentencing would lead to some sentencing reform because I think we keep missing opportunities to make our judiciary accountable. Well, certainly, um, I would agree with you that one of the most important things we can do is ensure that sentences get advice around the women's circumstances before she's sentenced. Um, and we have been running the PS and PSR pilots at site, five sites across um, England and Wales to promote the value of securing advice about women before they are sentenced um, and also looking at more problem solving courts. We've got the Greater Manchester Courts, which I think have set a good blueprint, actually, Lucy. Absolutely. But, but in terms of actually ensuring that we've got research to um, develop the learning, um, then that clearly needs that clearly needs that that attention. Fiona's just put in um, a question. She says, can everyone see that? Uh, so she's actually referenced, uh, it must be on the same page, uh, the Greater <laughs> Manchester Problem Solving Courts. She said, I'd like to see the focus on sentences and decisions to send women to prison to engage with health care. Um, and how this compares to a drive to bring more health care to women via the women's centres, perhaps whilst on bail. So um, I think we're all on the same, we're on the same page there. 
um, in terms of intervention at the earliest point. Um, Jill Greenwood, you've got your hand up. Um, I don't know if you want to come on camera or ask your question and introduce yourself. Hi, hi, um, it's Jill Greenwood here. I'm based at Manchester Crown Court as the probation officer there. I'm not there right now, I'm at home. Um, but yeah, it was, I suppose it was an observation really and it just in, in response to gaps in research just from what I observed with the women that I deal with at Crown Court, which is obviously the much more serious offences is a real um, gap in terms of the medical impact of giving birth and that postpartum period. I think, again, as Bev mentioned before, this was some, certainly an area which I overlooked until I'd personally given birth. And then the enormity of that period and the whole change of your, you know, your physical body and then your identity and then having to obviously be, you know, spinning lots of hats and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and certainly some of the reports I've written recently, a lot of the women have said to me, and unfortunately, a lot of them have been in offences against their own children, which obviously complicates things further. Um, but a lot of the women have said to me, you know, I just didn't feel like myself, you know, something happened. And, you know, mentally, I wasn't there mentally, I wasn't present. And I was behaving in this really impulsive, erratic way, which wasn't typical for me. And I found that that area just hasn't been explored fully. And even when the, it's, we've requested psychiatric assessments and I've been kind of thinking, well, this has got to be flagged in psychiatric assessment that there was a medical you know, link. But actually I found that often there, there has been very little about that. And um, yeah, I just, I just meant, suppose I wanted to make that comment about um, a gap missing really. Jill, that's a really um, helpful observation. I'm wondering if I can bring Bev in from her custodial perspective in terms of um, how, we, you know, what efforts are made to kind of um, understand women's experience who've recently been through childbirth and what more information may be or should be provided by community agencies to support that. So, Bev, do you want to come in in response to Jill? Yeah, sure. And, and this is a subject very close to my heart, actually, Jill, because I struggled myself as a new mum and not many people know that. And I was quite surprised how it did affect me um, and my mental health. So it's something I feel incredibly strongly about women coming into custody that do struggle and that guilt that you carry on carrying, even when you feel better. So certainly um, the questions that we ask um, when women arrive, have expanded to take into account um, not just how old are your children in the community and who's looking after them, but our healthcare staff also identify if if there has been any pregnancy loss or have have uh, have they been pregnant in the last two years. So that enables us to make the necessary um, support arrangements or, or or start that discussion around support that they might need. Um, it's not just about if they come in pregnant or with a child, because we know, um, you know, mental health wise, that's the most pertinent time where women could suffer um, during that period. So it is a question we ask and it's certainly um, support that we provide in the prison for those um, that have experienced that. And, and where we receive information from liaison and diversion teams in courts. That's always really valuable. Um, it would be great to see that rolled out nationally really consistently because I think um, where that information is obtained in court, if that was to follow somebody to prison, that would make, you, make a huge difference. And it, it would stop that necessity to ask somebody similar questions once they arrive um, because the information sharing element is so important um, that we don't re-traumatise asking the same things. Yeah, I mean, you make a really good point there, Bev, as well. And it links to what Anastasia was saying earlier about what's our definition of motherhood. Um, it's not the, the immediacy of motherhood. I, are you pregnant? Are you um, or have you recently had a child? But having a more broader definition in terms of how motherhood affects individual kind of sense of identity. And um, Lucy and I said from the very beginning with our mother's clubs, we didn't want to exclude anyone based on circumstances. 
Um, and that's been a really important factor in our work that, you know, you don't have to be somebody that's got a child in the community, everything's fine. Um, we've had such a spectrum of people that have valued that support from hearing from people in different circumstances. And that was something that came through very strongly in my research as well, that even even mothers who were not expected to resume the care of their children, their maternal emotions and the loss of their maternal identity was just as important, if not more important, to respond to than somebody who, who would go back home and return to motherhood. And, you know, the, the mothers who'd lost the care, in, in my research, they called themselves invisible mothers. And, and I thought that really... You know, it really represented uh, them, them really well. And, and there are a number of invisible mothers who, who we also have to pay attention to because it matters. It, it mm -hmm. really matters. Great. There's some really nice positive chat going on between Lucy and Jill um, in terms of um, Jill saying she'd be really keen to engage with you, Lucy, about how we can improve um, advice to courts. But I can see Mary's got a hand up and then Anastasia. So Mary, would you like to come in? Thanks very much, <clears throat> Sonia. Yeah, I think this question of maternal identity is very interesting. And I think we could even broaden it out a bit further to explore the um, extent to which or the impact of the desire to be a mother. Um, and I think there's an awful lot that we understand very little about that desire within the prison context. And, you know, as women seem to be increasingly sentenced to long sentences, what the impact of that on, you know, the potential fertile years or whatever um, can be and the impact of that. So I think there would be uh, it's something we're, we'd be keen to do here to explore um, questions of the impact on fertility of imprisonment and the barriers, the whole range, you know, uh, including biological barriers to having um, uh, children when um, in custody. I think that would also be something very much worthy of analysis, uh, again, in keeping with this idea of the maternal identity and the impact perhaps of the grief of not being able to fulfil it, if that's something the person wants to do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important point, isn't it, about future intent, to what, the wish to be a mother, and also the grieving process that women will go through if they lose that opportunity due to substantial um, sentences. Um, and actually, Rob Canton's just posted something up in the chat related to that and commenting on um, invisible mothers. Um, Anastasia, I'm going to ask you to come back in now, then Lucy, then Chelsea. Thanks. Uh, so, so many interesting points. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, is anyone looking into girls or adolescent women in prison? We were talking about this with Sari previously, that uh, although there are, uh, at least in our context, there are fortunately very uh, few um, underage girls in prison, but there might be one a year or one in two years, and, and they are practically alone because there is no group for them and you shouldn't put underage girls with, with the adult, adult prisoners. Uh, so we were uh, wondering if, if anyone is, is looking uh, into the situation or how the prison affects uh, an underage girl or an adolescent girl and, and their um, development, uh, their future. I'm not able to formulate this, but... <laughs> no, 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 you will be very, it's very clear. I mean... Um, it's certainly not an area of specialism for me, other than I know the number of um, young women um, who are in who have been detained um, in England and Wales are small under the age of 18 um, compared to the male population. Um, and that they, they they often present very complex needs, as you as you say. Um, and because the, the numbers are so tiny, it's about how you get proper wraparound service to that group. But um, I could probably put you in contact um, with one of the leads on our youth justice side, uh, maybe to give you to share, Anastasia. OK, um, sorry, did you want to come in and then I'll invite Chelsea to come back in? Yeah, that, uh, thank you. It was really important fact that Anastasia told 
earlier and, and about the identity and the variety it includes. I think from the research point of view in Finland, we have just a small number of research concerning women in prison or mat- maternal identity they they are struggling with and we definitely need that more and i was ju- just thinking that we should also uh, um, consider the re- research concerning the children of these mothers how mm. how does it affect on them about i i just thought what chelsea said earlier and talk about the backgrounds and the long term effects children have so that would be really interesting to do here in finland also because i think the backgrounds women have are really similar here in finland that you have in uk or in us so that would be really interesting to research about the children Mm-hmm. Also mm-hmm. here. Yep, no, absolutely. Um, Anastasia, um, Lucy just posted again that Sodexo are looking at um, reviewing um, the experiences of um, younger mothers. So I think you were talking about um, the under 18s or potentially the under 16s. Um, but yes. kind of both. <laughs> That yeah. Under 18s, but we could also consider under 21s yeah in this the same group but i that's really great to hear here lucy <laughs> there's a great paper by jilly sharp called precarious identities written in 2012 i think it's a really good paper about young motherhood and stigma right thank you that up. but i think it's strange that we we recognize that there are children who are in con- conflict with the law but we forget that there are children who have parents in conflict with the law mm. so in in addition to what Sari was saying. Okay. Chelsea, would you like to come back in? I'm aware that um, we're starting to approach time, so I just want to give people the opportunity to make some final comments or observations. Yeah, um, I I think that Anastasia made a very good point. I don't think there's enough research being done on juveniles who, juvenile women. Uh, For us, at least in the US, it's definitely not because of a lack of numbers. I know that most recent estimates say that I think 2015 in 2015 about 270,000 uh juvenile arrests were women were females Mm -hmm. um so we definitely have a large number i don't know how many are actually incarcerated right now off the top of my head uh but i know that those are the most recent numbers and so that's definitely underexplored and i have no doubt that a large portion of them are probably young mothers yeah um i also thought that Someone in the audience, I believe, maybe it was Jill, uh, the idea of discussing postpartum health related issues that's definitely underexplored and is something that is worth looking into. We often forget even for non incarcerated mothers about the fourth trimester and how much a woman can be undergoing during that period of postpartum after giving birth. Um, And so it is definitely ignored within the incarcerated women population. And I think that that's an avenue that researchers should definitely begin to explore. Yeah. And that was also commented on in the chat, Chelsea. So, um, and certainly from my point of view, it's one thing I'd certainly want to take away um, as the Chief Probation Officer in terms of thinking about what guidance do we currently give to court staff for women in that situation. Um, the other um, point, oh, now my chat's not working. Um, uh, 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 I don't know if there's any perspectives um, from the US in terms of, given the large numbers of women that you do have in, in prison, in terms of has there been any research um, around women's experience of giving birth in prisons? And that's the question from Margaret Dunley. Yes, and a lot of them, uh, a, a lot of the issues surrounding women giving birth in prison are ethical issues. First, I will say it's incredibly challenging to do research on health related issues for anyone who's incarcerated in the US. That information is severely restricted, and a lot of the Department of Corrections won't willingly give that up. Um, and so, birth is one of those health related topics. However, we we do know that. 
And it was very also interesting to hear uh, the rules that Mary highlighted for us earlier, because it's glaringly evident that these rules are not followed, right? Uh, so two of the main issues that we have in the U.S. are shackling during birth. And so most of the time women are um, handcuffed, both their hands and their feet to the hospital bed. Uh, and this is still done despite the fact that in 1976, the Supreme Court affirmed that the Constitution requires prisons to provide adequate medical care to incarcerated persons, similar to the medical care they would receive if they were not incarcerated, right? And so they stated that deliberate indifference to serious medical needs of incarcerated persons violates the Eighth Amendment's uh, prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Mm. The use of restraints during birth increases the risk of significant metal, medical harm to women um, and to the unborn child. And so we do know that a lot of women who go through birthing while they are incarcerated, um, they end up with a much more traumatic birthing experience, of course, and then secondary and collateral, collateral medical issues that they have to deal with. Um, and the second issue that we face here in the U.S. is there is usually immediate supervision, uh, separation following birth. Sorry. So the children, the infants are usually taken away from the mother almost immediately. Um, sometimes they will get a maximum of 24 hours together. However, after 24 hours, the, the child's always separated from the mother. And so there are, again, the collateral, collateral consequences of that. And those are two of the major issues that we face here in the U.S., surrounding birth specifically. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Chelsea. That was quite hard hitting for you to share with you still the, the experiences of women being handcuffed in um, prisons in America. I'm just aware we're coming up to time and it's always nice to end on a lighter note. So I just wonder if one of our guest speakers, maybe Bev, um, would like to give um, a really positive um um, headline or example of um, women as mothers being supported in custody. So, Bev, would you like to come in and um, just give us a nice positive to end on? Um, really, the positive for me would be um, we held a conference at Peterborough on Friday, which included all female prisons, probation, health, education, um, some magistrates as well talking about the impact of mothers and um, some of the women at Peterborough spoke at that event and uh, you know for me it's hearing those voices and and then women knowing that they could potentially influence change in a really positive way um, it, it was just fantastic I, I wish I could express it better um, but yeah, I think recognising a woman as a mother is is absolutely significant. And I think when when we start to do that, we really see the benefits of that. Um, we see women change physically um, in giving them ident that, in that identity back. So that's certainly something that I'll be focusing on in, in my role and, and try and spread that word nationally within the UK as well. Great. Well, Bev, thank you. That's such a positive note to end on. And, you know, to have those conversations across um, the, the whole raft of the criminal justice system, because that's where we will get the momentum, either to ensure that women who don't need to go to custody are offered uh, a meaningful community order, um, which benefits both them and their, their children. Um, but when women do go to custody, that um, the experience is such that they can maintain contact with their children and not have to, in a sense, dissolve their identity or hide it as a mother. Mm -hmm. OK, well, on that note, we are coming up to time. I've been told um, that um, if, if people want to revisit this, um, this webcam today, um, it is available, now people keep chatting and it's jumped around, it is available on the Criminal Justice um, Network um, link. So if you want to revisit or share our conversation with others, that's where you'll find it. And on that note, I'm going to thank everyone today for very thought-provoking um, contributions 
Um, and it's certainly, I've got a number of takeaways that I'll be taking and thinking about in my role as Chief Probation Officer for England and Wales in terms of how we can um, improve assessment, particularly pre-court. All right then, thank you everyone. Thank you for your contributions. Goodbye. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.